Wow, I'm I'm I, uh, I'm super hopeful uh, for humanity. I, I study uh, chaos theory quite a bit, and and just because if you understand how systems change, uh, <clears throat> when there's a system that's moving into disorder or disruption, the first thing that happens is that there's a wobbling, a polarity, an imbalance, and the polarity gets more and more extreme. And, and that's what we're seeing in the world, this extreme polarity. And then it's followed by this period of disorder, this period of chaos. And <clears throat> what they've found about chaos is that really it's just unpredictable order. There's an unraveling of the note of the way things have been and the unraveling energetically is novelty <laughs> it's new information and it's just not known so but what happens in time is it's uh, chaos it really looks chaotic but there's really if you watch it the algorithms when they computer generate this all of a sudden it'll turn into new patterns into new order so i think we're at the point in history where there's just um, where, I mean, I don't know about you, but nothing feels right to me. Something doesn't feel right. And I think there's so many of us that are looking for the right information. And there's so many things out there that uh, people are starting to question, which I think is so healthy. I think it's a really an amazing place. And I think that the biggest thing is that we can't face uh, these challenges and this chaos uh, in the same emotions that has actually created them. We can't live in fear. We can't be hostile. We can't be prejudiced. We can't be segregated. We can't uh, be impatient. We can't demonstrate. That's all the stuff that's that's unraveling right now. And and we have to really be. We have to really demonstrate order, coherence. You know, and 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 give people. You know, the the permission. You know, in a sense, uh, on some level, uh, to do the same. So. I'm a work in progress and you know for me if I'm alive the next day I got another chance at life you know and and I always ask myself you know just really like uh, the same questions in the beginning of the day who do I want to be and who do I not want to be and if I could sit down and remind myself how I'm not going to think how I'm not going to act how I'm not going to speak how I'm not going to feel and become so conscious of those unconscious states of mind and body that I would not fall prey to them the entire day, that's a victory. Mm -hmm. And that's going from, uh, to a greater uh, level of understanding about myself. And if I said to myself, who do I want to be when I open my eyes? <laughs> and how do I want to live this day? What thoughts do I want to fire and wire in my brain? And I start firing and wiring them with intention and attention. I'm going to put new hardware in my brain. And if I keep doing it enough times, the hardware is going to be a software program and that's going to be the new voice in my head that says, Joe, you can do it or be patient or be kind or whatever. If I said, how do I want to be in my staff meetings, on my Zoom calls? How do I want to be with my children? How do I want to be with my, my, um, uh, my friends? How do I want to be when I'm alone, when I'm in traffic, when I'm rushing? How, how is there another way to be? It turns out if you can close your eyes and rehearse mentally how you're going to be in that day, if you're truly present, the brain doesn't know the difference between what's going on in your outer world and what you're imagining. The brain is literally having the experience and experience enriches circuitry in the brain. So you're installing hardware. Keep rehearsing it. The hardware becomes a software program. And who knows? You just may start acting that way automatically. That's the name of the game. And then you become familiar with it. And if you said, God, what is my weak point? What is my weak emotion? Where do I default to in my life? Do I get impatient? Do I get angry? Do I get disrespectful? Okay, if I could today teach my body emotionally how I want to feel, and I got to remember this feeling, and I got to keep my attention on it, I got to keep it alive with my awareness and feel the feelings of my future before it happens. And if I can maintain this modified state of mind and body my entire day, independent of any condition in my environment, any drive, any need, any emotion, any habit in our, my body, and independent of time, I can sustain it. There should be something weird or something unusual or something new to show up in my life. And then at the end of my day, I could say in my imperfectly perfect, imperfectly perfect self, how'd you do? How'd you do today? You know, how do you, how did you do? Where did you fall from grace? Where did you lose it? Where, how could you do it better tomorrow? And if you could come up with an answer, what would love do? How would, what would greatness look like? Remind yourself that I think that 
would demystify the process of really falling in love with yourself and falling in love with life. And uh, we know that because we see people in some of our studies that have not just normal heart coherence, the amplitudes are three times higher than normal. That's not a little love. Yeah. That's a whole lot of love. Mm -hmm. Not a little brain coherence. So much brain coherence that the statistical probability from a mathematical standpoint on the research says that sustaining that state is impossible. That it would be a random event, a momentary event that would last for a millisecond. And we have people sustaining that state for 15 minutes. I know that it's possible, right? So, so then for me personally, uh, I'm the happiest when I'm learning and I'm the happiest when I'm changing, when I'm in, when my skin's in the game, when I'm out of the bleachers and I'm on the playing field and it takes work and it takes attention. And that's just not what uh, most people want to do unless there's crisis, unless there's diagnosis, unless there's disease, unless there's loss or trauma in some way, betrayal. That's when people make up their mind to change. And so I think that I'm, I think that community uh, in closing is the future uh, because I don't think there is a teacher I don't think there's a governor I don't think there's a world leader I don't think there's a, a, a doctor or a corporation uh, that really has uh, the answers uh, to what we're looking for and community uh, is the solution if you can get a group of people that really believe in each other that really trust one another, that really inform one another, that really support one another, that really acknowledge one another, that respect one another, that, that heal one another, that, that shine for one another so that they could shine. Uh, I think that is the answer because you see a group of birds all moving in the same direction or fish, a school of fish. In, in adaptation, in biology, that kind of that kind of coherence that's created, that's called emergence, it gives the appearance of a larger organism. <laughs> there's power in numbers. And if you study that, you think, there's, you think there's a leader that everybody's following, like it's a top-down phenomenon. It turns out it's not. It's a bottom-up phenomenon. Everybody is leading. Same, same mind. Uh, one mind, one heart. And, and I think there's a stigma, Glenn, that, that comes with leadership. You know, if you lead with too much conviction, you're going to lose your life. I mean, look at how many countless leaders, Martin Luther King, William Wallace, Joan of Arc, uh, anybody who uh, made a difference, Gandhi made a difference in the world, um, usually lost their life. And, and um, But, you know, I, I'm so hopeful because uh, if everybody's leading, you just can't take out everybody, you know, and, and, I, think, and I think that's the answer.